You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Sarah Jane Stratford. The Feisty Heroine Romance Collection of Short Stories. Over 30 plus pulse racing shorts to capture your heart with USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and award winning authors in the mix. Paranormal, contemporary, fantasy, and historical romance that will whet your appetite with titillating, heart pounding tales you'll want to read again, then beg for more. Fall in love with your next book crush. Pre order this amazing collection of shorts, over 30 pulse pounding stories, for only 99 cents. Proceed with caution. Buying this collection may lead to addictive reading, falling in love with your next book crush, and staying up past your bedtime to see what happens next. Get your limited edition copy of Feisty Heroines. Look for the link in the show notes of this episode. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Sarah Jane Stratford on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called Red Letter Days. Um, I love this book so much, and I'll tell you, Sarah Jane, I actually read um, your previous book, um, Radio Girls, and loved it so much. So I was excited to see um, that there was a, a fo- well, not a direct follow-up, but another book uh, in sort of the same vein uh, as that. So uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's so lovely, and I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I, absolutely. Um, Sarah Jane, we... Uh, begin the show each time with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because when I when I think of it, I I find myself sort of going to uh, to the quote in Pride and Prejudice where you know Mr. Darcy says, "Well, I was in the middle before I knew I'd begun." Um, and I feel like that's, that's how it is for me as, as a writer and a storyteller. It's just something I'd always been doing in some capacity or another. And, um, and, 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 and yes. And by the time I really started to think about it, I realized, wait a minute, I've already, I've already been doing this. Maybe (laughs) I'll, maybe I'll see what else I could do with this. I, I hear a variation of that story so many times, um, that it, it makes it, it makes you wonder: um, Are there born storytellers, or, or, or are people born that way? I do believe that you can uh, encourage and, and, and teach someone to um, you know to tell a decent story. Uh, but some people, I believe, are just born with a gift, or it's a gene, or I don't know what it is. What do you think of that? A curse. A curse. Um, yeah. <laughs> a hex. Uh, y- you know, I. I, I definitely think both things. I but I but I do think you know people who are inclined to be creative, you know, it's going to come out in some capacity or another. And you know, and certainly for me, um, you know, my mum was reading me stories, you know, when I was, you know, still an infant in arms. And, you know, certainly I I I, mean, I remember um, not just bedtime stories, but, you know, during the day, just whenever, you know, we would sit down and, you know, she'd pick up a book and read. And I loved it. And also, um, she was a theater aficionado. And so definitely one of my earliest memories is listening to um, cast recordings of various musicals. And my mom also happened to have librettos of a lot of the shows. So once I learned to read um, and, you know, well, beyond the basics, <laughs> um, you know, I, I would read the librettos and listen to the shows. And, you know, that's how I became obsessed with theater. But but it was also just OK. So the concept of storytelling in a lot of different forms was definitely ingrained in me very early on. Right. 
<laughs> um, you you obviously were a, a bookish kid. Uh, what were some of the stories that, you, other than the um, what you just referred to, what were some of the the stories that just captured your imagination? Oh, um, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's certainly it's it's it starts with all the classics. You know, where the wild things are. Um, you know, all the Dr. Seuss, of course. Um, you know, and then like the Ramona books. Um, and yeah, I mean, who didn't want to be Ramona? (laughs) And, um, and then, you know, sort of as I was, I got a little older and started really, you know, looking for a lot of different sorts of things. Um, the shoes books, which I feel like probably more girls read those than boys, which is too bad, but, um, but they are very well known amongst a lot of women oh, yeah. as, uh, I, you know, this, this, this series of you know, various stories of British children um, getting involved in the arts or performing in some capacity. And of course, for me, as someone who you know, knew I was going to be, you know, either, either an actress or a writer. Um, I thought about being an actress until I realized, wait a minute, I have no talent. Oops. <laughs> um, but, you know, those stories definitely, you know, fed the desire and, and the imagination. And I, I have a very, very fond memories of those. Sarah Jane, you have a very interesting accent. Um, <laughs> you were, you were born and raised in, uh, in Southern California, right? I was actually born in New Jersey. Okay. Raised in Southern California, and then uh, was living in New York before I moved to London, which is where I live now. Gotcha. So you got this great amalgamation of, uh, uh, you know, an affected uh, English accent on top of Southern California, which I just love. It's a, uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> um, as a storyteller, um, do you feel like place um, affects the kinds of stories you tell or informs? the way you tell stories. So um, growing up in, in, in Southern California by way of New Jersey and, uh, you know, transplanting to England by way of New York, do you feel like those places have seeped into you and affect the way that you uh, carry out your art? Oh, most definitely. Um, although at the same time, I would say, you know, part of what I love so much about reading and reading so widely is that you can go so many places that really you probably are not likely to ever go, um, including places that don't really exist. And, you know, that's, I, I mean, certainly that's part of what always got me excited about exploring the world as a person, but also as a storyteller. Um, you know, just the endless possibilities. Uh, but definitely, I mean, certainly, you know, I've mostly lived in, in cities and it's, you know, they, they, they can be very exciting, uh, particularly cities like New York or London, because they're so steeped in history and because so many different sorts of people have come through there and lived their lives there, whether, you know, triumphantly or tragically. And there is just so much to glean from that. And, you know, for me, I always feel walking around a city, you know, there's just this pulsing energy and it's, it's very invigorating for the, for the creative spirit. Also exhausting, but you know, in a (laughs) way. What was the first piece of fiction uh, that you um, decided to write knowing that, you know, from, from a kid who was just always writing, what was the first thing that you wrote that was purposeful that, that you, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do this and this is going to be on purpose. Right. Good heavens. Um, uh, I mean, certainly I was writing short stories, um, when I was still at, at school. So, Around, ooh, uh, um, I mean, gosh, I was going to say age fourteen, but you know, I think it actually—I'm I'm sure I was before then. Um, 
not anything good, obviously. <laughs> but, but certainly I was very early on. I, yes, I remember because I would always get inspired by what I was reading. Sure. And I I strongly suspect that initially, probably I wrote things that, you know, if we're going to be a hair splitter, we might call it plagiarism. <laughs> but, but, but it's not like I was doing it for publication. It was really just, I love this story so much. Can I create some sort of version of that? Um, and and then from there, um, begin developing uh, the means by which to really explore my own stories. And it's quite funny because um, um, I'm very close with my boyfriend's niece who is seven and I see her doing quite similar things you know she'll read you know, whatever she's reading um so right now she's reading the famous five books uh, by Enid Blyton and she'll write a little story and I realize oh you know it's it's basically all cribbing from the book and it's not that that's on purpose it's just that you know this is how just the 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 uh, mechanism of writing is sort of you know getting into her it's very exciting i mean you know who knows if she'll continue with that but it's re- rather lovely to see and it has triggered that memory for me of doing something very similar would you write through your influences uh before you find your own voice i've found oh absolutely yeah absolutely um sarah did i see that you um also uh have published a couple of uh urban fantasy books Yes, that was early on, and uh, those were those were great fun. But they, um, they, 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 I mean, they they did they did all right. But it, it was the sort of thing where I realized mm, I like this, but it's not really the sort of thing I want to continue to pursue. It's not quite. It, it, it was. I mean. It was, Certainly my voice, but yeah, it just, it didn't feel quite for me. Um, and it's funny because I'm, I'm also someone who just, I rail against the idea of genre because I just feel so strongly, look, stories should be for everyone. And, you know, obviously not everything is going to float everyone's boat and that's fine and wonderful. And that's why we have zillion sorts of stories. But I, I, I find myself getting rather frustrated with you know, this this constant push towards oh you know and, and this is only this sort of thing and this is only this sort of thing and you know it makes me feel very curmudgeonly when I was a kid you know <laughs> Those were just books. it's like no but it, I, you know certainly um, when like when when I was reading YA YA was just YA yeah and you and yeah and I I just I guess I feel like mm, you know, particularly for readers coming up, I I get nervous for them at this idea that, oh, well, I don't like this sort of genre or worse, you know, this sort of genre really isn't for a girl or a boy. Um, anyway, this is very, this is pro- probably going well off the rails of the original. <laughs> um but but uh, but I really what I what I've always been interested in, first and foremost, I I do love because I'm a recovering historian, but I I do have a degree in medieval history, and I've always just loved telling historical stories. You know, particularly because I became engaged, engaged by history, um, because of the stories, and particularly because of the growing realization that there's a lot of stories that are not being told. Right. There right. are a lot of people whom we, we, we know nothing about and, you know, we know that they existed. We know they had full lives, but they're very much lost to us in a lot of ways. And for a number of reasons, and of course, primarily that was women. And so now, I wouldn't say it's my my mission, but certainly um, this current book, Red Letter Days, and my previous book, Radio Girls, are very much about trying to bring real women 
who um, have fallen into some obscurity um, back to their their glorious life. <laughs> right. And 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 let's let's talk about Radio Girls. Uh, but before we do, just one one more mention about your early um, um, urban fantasy. Uh, mm. Can we just say Hitler? Um, you know, at war with vampires. I think that's all we need to say. I think that's, uh, uh, yeah. folks can, can go, uh, look that up and, and enjoy that. <laughs> um, but radio girl. So you, you told us that there, there are these, uh, women's stories that have kind of fallen into obscurity that need to be highlighted. Um, and, and not just for, you know, kind of the moral reasons, but because these are fascinating people with fascinating stories that, um, uh, you know, that that need to uh, that would make us all better if we if we know them. Um, what was uh, what was the kernel for Radio Days that came to you? R- radio Girls. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Radio Girls. I'm I'm jamming oh, the no, two together. That because I've been jamming them together a lot. Like, <laughs> why 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 do I have two titles that begin with R? That was <laughs> such a such a silly thing to do. Oops. Yeah. Uh, too late now. Um. Oh, well, I was doing some re- research on women in journalism in the 1920s, as one does. Just, you know, your way to spend an afternoon. And I happened to come across uh, the name of this woman, Hilda Matheson. And I read that she was the first director of talks for the BBC. And I was rather astonished. Oh, the first director of talks was a woman. Not the first female director, but the first director. Absolutely. Which is amazing. Yes. And I had to know more. And so I was looking her up and um, uh, there's a woman here, um, very well known, probably in the States, very well known for being one of the presenters of the Great British Bake Off, uh, Sandy Toxvig, who is, among other things, I mean, she's you know, a writer and entertainer and a minor historian. And she had written um, an article for The Guardian uh, to the effect of you know, five women we should know. And Hilda Matheson was first on the list. Like, all right, well, <laughs> Sandy Toxvig says so. I bet. Um, but I was already keen to know more, and I was looking her up, and I was just astonished at you know how extraordinary her life was, and you know how many people she interacted with. Um, I mean, she was hated by Virginia Woolf because she had this year-long affair with Vita Sackville West, um, and she, so she worked for the BBC and then she later went on to write the first book anybody ever wrote about broadcasting and, and, and various and other things. I mean, she had just lived this amazing life. So I, yeah, of course I, I, I had to try and tell her story and make people get to know her and, you know, one of the things that thrilled me so much was um, Radio 5. I had someone at Radio 5 read the book and was you know, appalled that they never knew of her because they said, as they wrote to me, I basically owe my career to her. Um, so they've started a small scheme, a sort of scholarship scheme called like the Hilda Matheson scheme. Um, you know, specifically for women looking to break into radio. And, you know, it's it's not that I set out to do things like that, per se, but it's so very gratifying. And you know, really, it's sort of the extension of what I hope to do, which is to get people to get to know this amazing woman and to realize that, you know, you know, an, an institution that we know and love today was in large part made what it is because of the energy and the vision of this woman. You chose an interesting way to tell um, Hilda Matheson's story, and that's through her interactions with uh, with Maisie Musgrave. Um, can you talk a little bit about the decision to tell the story that way, to not directly tell Hilda's story as in as if through her eyes, 
but uh, to, through the interactions of another character. So it was actually my editor's suggestion. Um, a couple of the early drafts, I, mean, I never got all the way, you know, just some some chapters I was working on. She said, you know, it it does feel as though you love Hilda so much that you're, you know, something, something's missing. It's, you know, it, it feels more like a glorified um, biography rather, rather than um, a proper three-dimensional story. And, you know, we discussed a few possibilities and she said, well, what about if we see her primarily through this fictional character who can maybe have some darker, more complex um, experiences uh, in, w w over the course of the story? And initially I did rail against that, I must say. But honestly, as as soon as I began noodling with it, I realized, OK, she's right. You know, in many ways, I was too close to Hilda because I uh, it was a bit of hero worship going on. And, yeah, that's great for some aspects. But, you know, it, it, it really wasn't working for the book. Sure. Well, it's, it's a fantastic book, and I highly recommend uh, everyone yeah. to pick up a copy of it. And uh, it were you surprised uh, by the reception that it got that uh, that, that people appreciated the story? And this this character, you know, uh, dug up from the past to who did not get her due. Well, I, I certainly wasn't surprised that everybody loved Hilda, <laughs> because what was not to love? Exactly. Um, but I, I I was well, I mean, really, I was just thrilled. You know, it it simply meant so much to me. Look, it always means means so much when anybody reads something and likes it or, or at least has a response to it, you know, because, you know, that's, I mean, writing is very solitary and very lonely, but I put it out there in the hopes that indeed much as, you know, I have had responses to, you know, so many works. I hope that other people will too, that they will get something from it. And, when I see just the extent to which that can happen, it's it's always just such a privilege and a thrill. So the new book, Red Letter Days, um, is uh, is a book very much in the same vein, not um, directly connected, but um, you know, it, it feels like a it, it it definitely has your voice, and and it feels you know, like part of your canon. Um, what was the motivation to to tell this story, and where did what was the the historical fact that got your gears turning? Right, so it's a bit two pronged. So, I <laughs> what happened was the twenty sixteen election, and um, and I had a very strong response to that, <laughs> and it it got me thinking about periods of American history that um, are maybe a, a little darker, more complex, um, perhaps when yeah, America was not at its best, shall we say. And I began to think about the blacklist, um, which I, I knew a fair bit about just simply because you're know, reading a lot of history and reading a lot of you know novels um you know maybe set in the 1950s or you know and, and certainly like film and television you know referencing it and I knew about the Hollywood 10 um but I didn't necessarily know a great deal beyond that so I I started doing some reading and I discovered this woman, Hannah Weinstein, who had left America um, a, a bit earlier on, sort of realizing that if she stayed, she was going to be blacklisted. She was potentially you know, going to be persecuted um, by the House on American Activities Committee. And she had small children. 
she, she she thought, well, perhaps the best thing to do is to go to Europe for a while until things calm down, not realizing that it was going to take quite a while. And, and when when abroad, she remade herself from having been a very successful uh, journalist and a speechwriter to um, Mayor LaGuardia in New York, uh, she remade herself as a producer. And she began this television program, The Adventures of Robin Hood, and made it a point to only hire blacklisted writers to write the scripts. And I just thought that was so phenomenal that that, that was really the beginning of p- putting together this story. Right. So like uh, like the last, um, uh, like Radio Girls, um, you created a character who could inhabit this real life uh, time period and scenario. Um, tell me about Phoebe and, and how she came about. So I've always loved the films of you know, sort of the 30s to the 50s, you know, the, with the classic, you know, the, the hard boiled dames, you know, like his, his girl Friday, you know, the, the sort of women, you know, very, very smart, very sharp talkers. Um, and yeah, tough as nails. <laughs> they're, they're, they're so much fun. And, um, I, I, I read quite a bit about other women who were affected by the blacklist, um, a uh, number of women I, I, I hadn't heard of, and I decided to sort of do an amalgam of some of them with this idea of the classic you know, New York Dame. Um, and I, <laughs> I named her Phoebe because I'm a huge, huge fan of Nora Ephron, and her mother was a screenwriter, uh, and her mother was Phoebe Ephron, so my, my character became Phoebe. And and even though you know I, I sort of got the idea for her her voice and aspects of her personality you know, through some of of those media, you know, really once I began working with her, she became her own person, which was of course very exciting. Sure. Uh, in the writing of this, um, you talked about the 2016 election and how that affected you uh, emotionally and deeply, and that uh, sort of uh, triggered uh, the want to write around these types of of subjects. Um, how did you? Uh, what were some of the the research that you did uh, on this time period, and what were some things that surprised you about it that might not be uh, common knowledge? Uh I began with reading a lot of memoirs. Um, I mean, I, I was also able to find things that someone had uh, put together and uh, done a number of interviews of you know people at the time who, including interviewing some of the um, some of the men who worked for the FBI and tailed suspected communists, uh, which was a pretty extraordinary read um, yeah, because the fellow was so matter of fact saying, well, you know, when, when the whole family had gone out, we let ourselves in the house and started just going through all their papers and studying grocery receipts and you know, library books. And, and I, I was just reading this thinking, wow, that was happening in America, uh, yeah, after we had very decisively you know, won the Second World War and were you know, indisputably the greatest power in the world, and this was all quite legal. Um, and and you know, to this day, he, he, he wasn't particularly bothered by it. I mean, he wasn't necessarily uh he 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 didn't say well yes it was the best thing we could have done but you know, he didn't seem to regret it either oh, gosh all right um uh but then i also read some things that were surprising but uh, you you sort of have to laugh so 
you know, we all think about phone tapping, um, you know, because it comes up in films and television all the time. And what I hadn't known was that the phone tapping could be very peculiar. So what what might happen sometimes is you would, you know, the phone would ring, you would pick it up, and there would just be nobody there. And, you know, that's fair enough. But then another time, you might you might answer the phone and hear a recording of a conversation you'd had a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago. And that just made my jaw drop. <laughs> All right. That's utterly bizarre. And what made me laugh, except not really, <laughs> was that you realize all right, look, obviously everybody quickly twigged my phone's being interfered with. And of course, I would have always thought, well, certainly if a phone's being tapped, you know, that's meant to be a covert operation. You know, the person whose phone is being tapped isn't meant to know. But presumably in this instance, they were meant to know because it was precisely meant to further unsettle them. Right. Oh man, and and you use all sorts of little tactics like that to uh, keep the tension amped up um, in this book. It, it definitely feels like a a bit of a historical mystery thriller uh, in in places. Um, when when you start thinking about a book like this, and um, you know this is a in historical era that we that we know a lot about. We don't know everything about, as you have proven. Um, but you know we're you can mention McCarthyism to, to, you know, just about anyone. And they have a general idea of what, what happened. And, and we know how that era ended and, you know, the, the further progress of the nation. Um, how do you decide um, when you're going to write a story during this time where it is, you know, fairly well known, how do you decide where the story begins and ends? What, what window are you shooting to look for, for the reader? Well, you know, it, it, it's it's funny you ask because you know initially I noodled with a few possibilities, but ultimately I just decided to it, I'd be best off being guided by Hannah's real experience. Um, in that the Adventures of Robin Hood began broadcasting in 1955, so I thought you know, and and that was the middle of the blacklist era. Um, and the blacklist began in 1947. So it seemed like that was a, a very good era, uh, period in which to begin, um, in part because presumably a, a number of people might have become uh, rather comfortable in thinking, well, anyone who's going to be blacklisted, that's already happened. and that's not going to touch me. Um, which is, of course, you know, a, a, a fallacy that historically we see repeated many times, many, many different scenarios. Um, so, so yes, so I thought, right, I'll uh, do about, you know, roughly a year or so. I, in many ways, I kept the timeline just a tiny bit uh, mushy and that was deliberate because everything that's happening is very unsettling. And you know how it is when you're a bit unsettled. I mean, everything is a bit off and you do sort of lose track of time and you're not quite sure what's when. And you have something that seems like, you know, it was ages ago. Like, no, 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 that was actually only three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to play play with that just keeping the characters slightly emotionally um, off balance and, you know, doing, play, play, playing that for the readers as well, that, you know, that I, I, of course I want them to be, you know, engaged and energized by it, but yeah, just have this slight sense of everything being a bit, a bit off. There's something that I love about, uh, uh, a writer as the hero, as the, um, you know, it's a, it's a guilty pleasure for, for writers to, uh, to see one of our kind, 
um, <laughs> you know, bearing the standard and, and sticking it to the man, um, <laughs> so to speak. Um, this had to be so much fun to write. I can I can only imagine, uh, you know, your imagination going wild. Um, do you write with an outline? Um, do, do you plan things out ahead of time or are you discovering the story as you write? So uh, for me, it's a combination of both. Uh, when I'm first getting to know the characters, um, I will just write scenes for them. And I I would say probably I could end up writing a, a, a good number of pages. And ultimately, most of that doesn't end up getting used. But it's it's just a way of you know, getting a sense of you know, who they are, who the, how they speak, and particularly, of course, you know, how they interact and how they respond to a circumstance. Um, and once I'm feeling very confident about that and like, OK, we all know each other and we all have a pretty good understanding of each other, that's when I go back and uh, create an outline um and in inevitably i will stray from the outline as as the story progresses yeah let the characters Definitely. become more alive yes and also just just you know realizing as you know as certain things are unfolding um you know there's it's always the realization of oh actually i don't need to have this sequence because in fact this really becomes a bit it's over explanatory you know people will people get it um you know i can i can leave that one lie um or you know the other thing that can happen is you know, you're going along and see oh actually i should have this <laughs> i love it the book is called red letter days it's uh you're hearing this it's out and available everywhere now That's in kindle amazing. edition or hard copy uh or uh audiobook uh, either so uh there are links to it in the show notes of this episode uh sarah jane if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do uh, is there a place where they can connect with you online Oh, they can connect with me everywhere. I have a website, uh, sarahjanestratford.com, and um, there it also gives links to my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Excellent. We'll put links to all that in the show notes as well. Uh, Sarah Thank Jane, you. this has been so much fun talking, and I love the books. We're going to send Thank everyone you. to see you. Thank you so much. And have a way to bring him a martini, which he was down before he hit the. <laughs> Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The near future. Humanity, structure of story, and things like that. But I, I really enjoyed the creative process. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, 
the probe took in more data. It scoured the internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, 
and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen, the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to it... Some things you write now, uh, do they differ in the writing process from... Uh, from Plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? he asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? he asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.